I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let a record show that a quorum of members is present, that the meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. It's 6 o'clock. If you would, please stand with me as Mrs. Bush leads us in the invocation. Mr. Williams, in the <coughs> Pledges of Allegiance. Please bow with me if you choose. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for this wonderful first semester of our school year. I uh, ask that you be with our students over this break, that you keep them safe, that you keep them healthy, and you bring them all back in January ready to uh, finish out the year strong. I pray for wisdom tonight and decisions we will be making and continue to bless us with a uh, united board. In your son's name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Mr. Williams. Item 2A, special district recognition. 2016 UIL 6A Boys Cross Country State Champions. I'd like deja vu, Dr. Stockton. Well, we have a very special treat tonight. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Greg Colson to come and introduce our, our special guests. Dr. Stockton, Mr. Husbands, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to recognize a very outstanding group of uh, young student athletes and their coaches. Um, before most of us are up in the morning, these guys are out running the roads, training, and uh, many of them uh, put more miles in in a week than some of us do in our cars. So it <laughs> requires a great deal of dedication. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our head cross country coach, Juris Green, who will introduce the team. Thank you for inviting us back. I, I said before, this is always a goal for us because if we're here, something good happened. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we, we always say on campus, it's a great day to be a Highlander. And if you're a fan of Highlander sports, the fall semester has been a good one for you. Our tennis team got to levels it hasn't before. Our volleyball team continues to be uh, what it has been for a long time. Our football team's playing for a state title this weekend. Um, and these guys here won their 19th state cross country title in 38 consecutive appearances. Mm -hmm. I have to say that the drive and the passion behind what we do on our campus is because of one man, and that's Greg Colshin. I, I pride myself on getting to school early in the morning before the guys arrive, but my car is always the second in the parking lot. He is already in his office. The, the car is cold because I've checked. I want to see how close I am to get uh, But he's already there and, and he sets a tone on our campus and it's no wonder why all of our, of our programs, no matter athletic or academic, they want to achieve because of the examples that he sets for us. In 2015, we won our 18th state title. And of the seven guys that ran for us, five were seniors. And so at the beginning of the 2016 season, you, you, know, you think there's some questions about some holes to fill. Uh, but our, our attitude on our on our team is such that you, you fill those gaps. You, you step up when needed. And when you look on our roster, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at names and, man, I hope this, this kid here steps up because I really think he's matured and, and, and he's ready to do something. And not only does he do that, but he overproduces. And then you have some guys who are on this team that I didn't think would or could do the things that they did. Um, I, I've been a head coach here now for, at the Williams for eight years. It's my, my fourth state title, and this is the sweetest. Um, because of that attitude, we get to the state meet and we win by 52 points. <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, 72 points. We, we scored 51, won by 72. Um, and it's because of that drive and the passion that, that they have every day that's so infectious on that campus. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce six of the seven members here for you. Uh, first off, my assistant coach, uh, Chris Bales. Our sixth place finisher in the state meet, Gavin Hoffpar. Our seventh place finisher, Noah Wells. Our 11th place finisher, Daniel Baker. 
Coming off memory, 22nd, I believe, Jacob Rayford. <laughs> and then Ethan Mercado, I think he was around 24th. <laughs> and then just a couple behind him, Austin Childry at 26th. Gentlemen, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Conroe Independent School District and the administration, we want to uh, express our thanks to you for the way that you have represented our district. Um, I am officially unbiased and unpartisan when it comes to uh, CISD schools, but I myself am a Highlander. I graduated from McCullough High School <laughs> back when it was, before there was a Woodlands or a college park. Um, and I went to one cross country workout the summer after my eighth grade year. Uh, Coach Green, the first, came over to Knox Junior High and said, uh, anybody want to come work out this summer for cross country? And I went to one workout, realized very quickly I was not a distance runner. <laughs> Thank you for helping me realize that, Coach Green. Um, but, but to accomplish 19 state championships over just under four decades, that, that's absolutely amazing. Wherever we go in the state, wherever we go in the nation, people know Woodlands High School cross country. The, the effort that you put into this, both in your studies and in your, your athletic endeavors, are a shining example to the other students and the other student athletes in this district. So thank you. And we have a plaque to present to you to the 2016 6A state champion boys cross country team. We're very proud of you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the pictures are being taken. I would like to make recognition of, of um, the first Coach Green. Uh, Danny Green is here today with us. And Danny uh, had, I have it correctly, 30, 30 years, 15 state championships. Wow. So what you're looking at, yeah, that's, yeah. That, is, that, is, that is worth the same. <laughs> So what you're looking at is a, a, a father-son legacy of 19 state championships in 30 years. Um, where's our press at tonight? That's that's a story. <laughs> um, it's just absolutely incredible. And and Juris, Juris made an interesting comment that you're both 50-50. You had 15 state championships in 30 years. Juris has four and eight. 50 50 it's just it's just yeah. incredible Danny thank you for being here tonight and and all that you created and Juris thank you for carrying on the great tradition it's and Juris it's all right if you outperform your dad <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much <laughs> but the truth is one of the reasons I wanted Juris to have this job is because I knew that little rascal was arrogant enough
coaching. <laughs> Okay, hey, item 2B, Special District Recognition Energy Solution 2015 Outstanding RMS Partner of Excellence in Energy and Resource Management Award, Dr. Stock. All right, I'm going to ask Dr. Hines to come present that information item. Good evening, President Husbands, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton. It's um, my pleasure and privilege to be here tonight to um, introduce, um, to present to the district uh, the Energy Solutions 2015 Outstanding Resource Management System Partner for Excellence um, Award. This acknowledges excellence in energy and resource management achieved through the district's participation in Entergy's innovative pilot RMS measure. Resource Management Services, or RMS, is a measure offered within the Entergy score, that's the school's conserving resources program. Uh, energy manager Roger Garvey, Roger's here tonight, uh, and Dwight Martin, our assistant director of maintenance custodial department, is also here tonight. Both these gentlemen uh, participated in regular energy management strategy meetings led by Clear Result and carried out adjustments and behavioral changes recommended through the program to achieve a 3% target savings goal of 80,978,717 kilowatt hours. Tonight, uh, here to present the award is Mr. Phil Lanier, Administrator of Energy Efficient Programs. And if he'll come up, also with him tonight is Amanda Cambry, the Program Manager for RMS, and David Ruba Calva, program consultant. Good job on his last name. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Uh, again, Phil and Aaron with Entergy Texas, thank you so much for letting us come out tonight. Um, I normally am here, and y'all see me with a big golf tournament style check. We have fun presenting those checks to you guys. We got something a little bit different tonight <laughs> that we're presenting uh, you guys an award for Connor ISD for saving quite a bit of energy without spending any money. So this is grandma logic, as, as he was saying. This is grandma logic of how to turn on lights, how to turn off lights, when to, how to adjust your AC thermostats. You didn't spend any money. You saved about 3% off your electric bill. That represents a lot of energy savings. When we look at it in terms of dollars and environmental impacts, it's huge for our, our community. You know, that's about $200,000 a year off your annual electric bill that you have saved just by shutting off the lights and turning your ACs up a little bit. And so that's the equivalent of what? Four teacher salaries. Or uh, if you look at it from an environmental impact, uh, that's the equivalent of removing uh, 368 cars off the road off the entire year. Or another way of looking at it is, is you've offset the equivalent of burning 196,000 gallons of gasoline you have removed from the air just by turning off the lights. So very, very simple grandma logic. We like to see that. Or if you look at it in terms of, of Christmas and our environment we're in today, you know, that also, that dollar savings is also the, the equivalent of purchasing 80 reindeer. <laughs> I, looked up the, I looked up the price of, of 80 reindeer. Yes, uh, we have a fan right here. Uh, so 80 reindeer. So I'm, uh, Dr. Stockton, I'm sure the FFA will be excited about, you know, 80 new reindeer coming in, in, the, in the program this year. But, you know, we want to give a special recognition to Roger Garvey, Dwight, and Marshall uh, for participating in the program. They've worked with your maintenance staff, the custodial staff. The, 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 uh, they worked with principals and students on how to operate the buildings. And we're hoping that's going to translate the students taking that home of saying, you know what, when I leave this room, I'm a trophless light. I can adjust the, the thermostat up. If I'm cold, I'm going to you know, put on another extra layer there. Saves a lot of energy, makes a big impact, but without this staff here, uh, y'all made it a, a big win, and this is a pilot program for us, and y'all have exceeded our expectations. So with that, I want to say thank you on behalf of Entergy Texas, and uh, we're looking to see more energy savings every year from you guys. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat>
mind coming this way? Good to know. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Just walk right down. Everyone wants to shake your hand. Oh, my God. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Oh my goodness. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. 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 All right. Item three, consent agenda. I've heard no request to remove any items. If that continues to be the case, I would entertain a motion in a second. I would move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. So now, we have a motion in a second. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Very much. Item 4A, consider approval of the district in of an innovation. Dr. Stockton. I'll ask Dr. Null to come present that item. Good evening, President, husbands, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. Tonight we're here to take the next step along our process uh, with the District of Innovation. If you'll recall, back in October, uh, we came to you seeking your approval for us to begin to uh, explore this process. You uh, granted us that through resolution and you appointed a committee, uh, which was our district uh, <laughs> level planning and decision making committee that was charged with investigating this and developing a plan. Uh, that group worked, worked very diligently had great conversation from input from from community members and teachers and parents and, and administrators alike uh, to develop the plan um, throughout the process we then put that plan online and we received feedback we received feedback last month uh, in this meeting as well and we we took all that feedback back to the committee and they worked once again um, to work through those and and they're excited today to present um, what is their, their final recommendation for the district of innovation plan and under this plan they have uh, only one aspect that we would wish to include in our district of innovation plan and that is flexible school calendar by statute uh, we are not allowed to begin the new school year before the fourth monday in august next year that happens to be august 28th um, and by including this on this item on our district of innovation plan we would have you would have the option to approve a calendar that would have us start earlier than that date it's not something that we would be mandated to do but that would give you the option to do that if you so choose if you so chose to do so so at this time we seek your approval for our district of innovation plan do i hear a motion uh, a motion you? A second a motion and a second any discussion <coughs> questions observations seeing none all those in favor signify by raising your right hand all opposed like sign and passes. Thank you very much, Dr. No. Item 4B, consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the Knox Junior High School and Woodlands Transportation Center project. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mr. Foster, if you'll present that item, please. Good evening, President Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed, price, guaranteed maximum price amendment for our Knox Junior High. <clears throat> additions and the Woodlands Transportation Center renovations project. In March, we selected Dramala Construction as our construction manager at risk for the Knox Junior High School additions and the Woodlands Transportation Center re renovations project. Based on the proposal prepared by Dramala, we have negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of $11,120,157 for this work. Contract documents are being prepared by our outside counsel. At this time, we are requesting your approval so move motion to approve the uh, GMP second I have a motion in a second Any questions no I have one quick question what was the original or what's the what's the amendment the amendment is just the term used to establish the guarantee maximum price there's two parts to our contracts a master agreement and then the amendment okay. establishes the so project. it's not amending the price no sir it, it's just any other questions? No, oh, sir. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. 
Foster, uh, item 4C, consider approval of guarantee max price for the 2017 <clears throat> life cycle. Uh, Mr. Foster, please. At this time, we bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed maximum price amendment for our 2017 life cycle projects. These projects are mechanical, electrical, plumbing, roofing, building envelope, normal items that wear out over time. In February, you, we selected GTT as our construction measure at risk for the 2017 life cycle projects. Since then, GTT has prepared a proposal for this work, and we've negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of $8 million. $167,886 for this work. Again, same, the contract's being prepared by outside counsel, and this time we're requesting your approval. Here's the motion, second. So, I'll make the motion. I'll second. Motion <coughs> and a second. Any questions? Observation, discussion? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Uh, item 4D, uh, update on attendance zones for Oak Ridge Feeder Zone School. Dr. Dr. Hines, if you'll come and present that information for the board. Again, good evening, President and Husbands, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Stockton. Uh, tonight, um, I'd like to present an update on the uh, rezoning that is going on, just to kind of, I know we've uh, brought this forward in October and um, back tonight to kind of update you of where we are in the process. Uh, as just to go back a little bit and review, uh, we're we're a fast growing district. We're adding more than 1,500 students per year, and to meet that demand, we we do have to open new schools. And um, in 2017, next fall, we uh, are on schedule to open Lucille J. Bradley Elementary School to serve students in kindergarten through fourth grade. And that school is going to be located at 4200 Falls Lake Drive, which is in uh, the Falls. Uh, we'll also be opening a new 1,000 student intermediate campus in August of 2018 that we refer to as Flex 18, and that's going to serve students in grades five through five and six. And that's going to be located at Woodson's Reserve Parkway in Trench Lane. And then also in the fall of 18, we'll be opening Grand Oaks High School at 4800 Riley Fuzzle, which will accommodate roughly 3,100 students. And that's going to open with uh, students in grade 9 and 10, which are our current 7th and 8th graders, and we will phase in a grade level each year sir, until we're serving all grades 9 through 12 in August of 2020. So those are the three schools that are coming online. And uh, to just to, I know uh, Mr. Foster in a minute will give you an update and show you the construction picture, so I'm not going to show you those. and just give you these are the renderings of the front entrances. And this is Flex 18. So to, to begin to populate these schools, we, we begin a process of looking at the zones. And to do that, we have an attendance boundary committee. And this committee is made up of principals and a parent from the schools that are in the area that are going to be impacted. Uh, and so in the case of uh, Bradley Elementary and Flex 18, there's a group of uh, elementary schools. So it's a little smaller committee. Um, and I don't know if we have any of our committee members here tonight. Got, got one, so mm -hmm. yeah, got Alan's here, Mr. Fisher. And um, we also have, and he's on both committees. And so we have a larger committee working on the high school uh, boundary question since that impacts the entire Oak Ridge feeder system. And so we have a larger committee. And the committee's been at work since October, and we've developed several scenarios for each of the campuses. And based on uh, many considerations, uh, the committee eventually settled on two scenarios for each of the three campuses to bring out for public feedback. And this committee's had, we've had a total of six public meetings to date. We've had hundreds of people come to our meetings. We've also received over 850 high school comments, many of which we've shared with you and several petitions. And uh, we've also had uh, roughly 130 elementary and intermediate <coughs> comments to date. So uh, lots of information, lots of communication, and that's, and that's what we wanted. We wanted to get feedback. So we will, uh, we've just completed our, our community forum number one, and well, we plan to go back out in January to update um, the community. We also have been putting a lot of information up on our website, and just I won't go to all the sites, but we have the different scenarios that are up there. Uh, originally, we started where people could create their own scenarios, and then we've kind of evolved to showing what the scenarios are that we brought out for uh, public view. 
and, and now what I'd like to do is just briefly give you a quick overview of the two that we brought out and, and what they represent. Um, it, first, I'll begin with the elementary and flex 18 scenarios. Uh, and when we worked on those, I think probably our biggest challenge is the location of the schools. They're very close to one another. Uh, the elementaries, if you think about Kaufman, Burnham Woods, Bradley, Snyder, are all kind of in a line going up Burnham Woods Drive. And um, so that's a challenge. Uh, and in, in Flex 18 is very close to Cox Intermediate. So um, it, makes, it makes for some arbitrary boundary drawing uh, when we look at it. Um, we also, you know, we, we really, after talking about it, we're trying not to open up a brand new school at capacity. So that was another one of our goals, try to avoid that. So we kind of set 800 as kind of a basic target, try not to go above. We also, one of the goals was to try to create room in our other schools that are experiencing growth so they have some capacity. Um, and then we did look at trying not to split neighborhoods, and uh, that's really difficult, especially when it's a large number of students come out of a neighborhood. So uh, we did try. We weren't successful 100%, but we did reduce the number that were impacted significantly. So I'll, I'll briefly kind of hit the highlights of elementary scenario one and elementary scenario two. Um, and, and in this, you know, the question is, where did the students come from that would populate Bradley Elementary? And um, it would come from the falls. We have a zone south of the falls. We have Bristol Lakes and Wright's Landing and Legends Trace that are currently in the area zoned to Burnham Woods would be zoned to Bradley. Creekside, which is currently zoned to Broadway, would move to Bradley. Uh, Legends Run. Uh, west of Burnham Woods Drive is moved to Snyder, and I'll show you this on a map in a minute. And, and the Meadows <coughs> is moved from Burnham Woods to Kaufman. And then Harmony, we have a section east of Rayford, so Harmony is one of those neighborhoods that would be split, and I'll show that to you on the map, um, would go from Broadway to Snyder. And this accomplished a lot of things with the numbers. Uh, the first column is what the current enrollment is at the, at the schools. And you can see at Kaufman, we've had kind of a declining enrollment the last few years. So we looked at ways to kind of bring in some numbers. Um, Burnham Woods, on this scenario, comes out with 843, Bradley 773, Broadway 718, Kaufman 889, and Snyder 820. Oh, oh Dr. Hines, go yes. back for a second. Yes. I'm accustomed to totals being at the bottom of everything. Uh. <laughs> I don't. Did we lose kids? Current enrollment versus scenario one. We look like we lost 200 kids. We. That is very possible. <laughs> what y'all do with them? <laughs> they went to fifth and sixth. What? They went to fifth grade. Yes. Well. Is that it? Is it they, they, there is a there is a cohort. So, so. Yes, the answer to that is. The other thing I will, I'm going to explain something. Current enrollment is who's there today. The number on the right is who lives in the zone. Mm -hmm. So when we plan, okay. we plan on who lives there because that's all we can count on. But all of our schools are made up of an additional pool of students that come from teachers who bring their children to school there. Um, we may have a special program at that school that, in, that would bring in students to attend. And that's where we sometimes we move the program where we have room. So there is a difference between enrollment and what we're using to project because I would think you take more of a conservative approach and pro project what's current enrollment as your scenario one enrollment and date of opening. Otherwise, you're gonna have to put those kids somewhere. We do. They just show up. But we, we do have the flexibility of adjusting our, our special programs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And that's also why we wanted to bring in some, give them some growth capacity. Um, but there's you, also, you don't know which teachers are going to have kids at which schools year after year either, correct? Correct. Can you, so. can you answer one question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that number is pretty relatively small. I mean, you got 80 teachers. If each teacher brought a kid, that's just 80 kids. Correct. And I don't presume all the teachers have kids. But it's not just the teachers that are there. Well, okay. I'm just needing right now. Well, you know. for example, at Snyder, there's roughly 50 pre-K students at Snyder. They're not going to show up. They're showing up as currently enrolled, but they're not showing up on a projection because they're not in our current okay. system. So. You can plan for it. I mean, I don't want to belabor the point. I'm, we're good. I get your point, but there's also going to be homeschool and kids at uh, private school that you're accounting for in scenario one that aren't going to be there as well. So it's it's, it's got to be difficult to actually get a true number because you know day one 
you don't know. But I, I understand what you're saying. Why don't we just use the ratios of the kids that are enrolled right now towards towards these? But if what you're saying is all of these numbers in scenario one does not put any one of those schools at capacity, is that what you're? Correct. And that's 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 one of the number one goals yes. is to make sure we're not at capacity day one at any one of those schools. Could you breeze through the capacities on these right quick, please. Yeah. Um, yes. They all are they all a thousand? They are all a thousand. <coughs> okay. That's, that's Dr. Hines. Yes. You had mentioned that one of the goals was to open Bradley with eight hundred or less. Correct me if my memory is wrong here. It's being built on the same basic footprint as Stewart and Patterson, which were thousand capacity. Yes. We originally only built Stewart out to eight hundred and had to expand it yes. to a thousand. Is Bradley gonna initially be completed to its full thousand capacity? Yes. Okay. yes. But it also has some areas of growth in its attendance boundaries as well, so it, it won't stop at 800. It'll continue to grow. Uh, but I do want to go back and, and just real quick reiterate: we do use geocoding of of basically who's enrolled in our school system currently mm -hmm. that lives within that physical ge geographical background that, uh, area. So that's how we determine that number. So just to kind of hit the highlights on the map, I'll, I'll use the cursor to move around a little bit, but um, Bradley would be the area in gray. And um, this- You don't have the ability to make that bigger, do you? <laughs> I'm gonna ask it for everybody. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. We can make it bigger. Um, and so- I bring my readers, Ray. <laughs> can I borrow those? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now we're we'll always have um, them. <laughs> so, just to kind of point out some of the highlights, <clears throat> this this area is Legends <laughs> part of Legends Run, and this is Legends Run, and that is one of the areas that ended up being split, and a lot of that was just sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we used Burnham Wood Drive as a major thoroughfare that runs in between the neighborhoods, so that became the separation um, on that line. Um, also, this area, A57 and 57P, are part of Harmony, and um, and, and so they actually are right across the street from York. Mm -hmm. One section is very close to York and Cox, right across the street. And they, these two areas currently go um, to Broadway Elementary. Which ones are changing? Can, and I've got two questions. Which ones are changing relative to where, the, well, I understand you bringing in Bradley, so those are gonna So change. everything in gray is a change, and I'll just kind of quick, quickly hit the highlights. The, the, the area coming from uh, 57Y and 57N was currently at Snyder. A57 and 57P was at um, Broadway Elementary School. Um, 57B was at Broadway Elementary School. 57L, 57G, and 57Z uh, were all at Burnham Woods Elementary. And uh, 57K was at Burnham Woods Elementary on this map. Everything so, looks so, I mean, pretty reasonable here, except that 57G. And these kids in 57.7, 57C, and 57X, why are they jumping over here to go to Burnham Woods? It's just, it's just, uh, it, it's one of those deals where that's where we get the numbers. Okay. Um, so that's Legends <laughs> Trace. 57G is Legends Trace. And Legends Ranch we could have achieved the numbers, but we would have split the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we left Legends Ranch together and we moved Legends Trace. Uh, 57S is Legends Estates, and we just didn't get very many students out of that section. Uh, so that's really why um, that was moved. And can I just ask one question? Yes, sir. Where are all these schools that we are discussing? The the five schools that were listed a moment ago, okay, from Coffin, are they all Cox, York? No, Coffman. Okay. Coffman. Is, is that another reason why this is split that way? Yes, I mean, uh, so in in all of the scenarios bringing forward uh, that have the meadows moving, um, that would also change to Vogel, and would change to Oak Ridge High School, and we would change to Irons Junior High. And that's 57K, correct? That's 57K. Okay. Where is 57K? <laughs> north <laughs> of Kaufman. <laughs> that's that I north pink section of Kaufman, Daytron. It's just yeah. north of Kaufman. It's this the section, <clears throat> 57K. As opposed to Vogel Irons. 
or okay. Oak Ridge opposed to the new. Okay. Yeah. And certainly we've had feedback about that, uh, and you've seen that. But it, it is in terms of numbers, and the committee looked at it. Um, at build out the meadows is projected to be 1,200 homes currently. Um, there's about there's 360 homes there, so it's about 30 percent built out. Uh, it's not building at a real fast rate, but it does it would move some some more growth into the Oak Ridge area. And it's on a map wise, you can see why it's it's very close to Imperial Oaks and would make sense to move. Yeah. Elementary scenario two is basically what you just saw with a smaller section being broken off from Harmony. Um, and so if you look at the numbers on this one, Snyder's a little bit smaller than the previous one, and uh, Broadway stays a little bigger. And I will uh, we'll, we'll go to the map and just show you. So 57P. P. <laughs> so 57P <clears throat> stays at Broadway. And again, that gives Broadway still room for growth. Mm -hmm. and give Snyder room for growth. And Snyder's growth mostly coming from um, Woodson's Reserve. Um, it, it's a, and it impacts fewer, fewer students. And, and I will tell you, <clears throat> at our last meeting as the committee, this one was a very overwhelming, had a lot of support. So right now that's the a, one. A57 is what? Harmony. And 57P is Harmony. And so is Q and W and V. Yeah. Okay, okay, so that whole piece is. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of where you split it, and why is this one so much more popular? Well, it's, well it, just, it just moves fewer students, and it keeps okay. Broadway a little bit bigger. So if you, it, this one divides it on Lexington. There's a street in Lexington that runs through there, mm -hmm. and which is a pretty big street, and so it, it uses that as a divider instead of Rayford, and it just moves fewer students. And so, again, if you go, one of our things was trying not to move more than we needed to move to accomplish the goals. Well, one of the things I see is Snyder still has a large area that is to be developed at some point. Yes. And so I like personally, I mean, the idea of moving less students back to Snyder and taking from Broadway leaves us more room for as that grows to keep us still under capacity or right at capacity. Correct? Yes. Okay. Very good. 57 S, C, and X would go where? Burnham Woods. They would go to Burnham Woods. Yeah, well, <laughs> I have some issues with color <laughs> That's why I need a big, and I can see greens and reds. We understand the glass. Blue. Is colorblind, too. <laughs> I got all kinds of problems. There's a there's a side-by-side -side view. Of and so, and this one, as I mentioned, there's just very, very few differences. So let me ask you, um, Dr. Himes, is, is, I mean, do you have any strong opposition one versus the other? I mean, the schools are all... Uh, when those schools you know, turn around, I don't know where I'm at. I mean, the, the there's been mixed comments, meaning that some like something, and other people will say they don't like it. Uh, you know, we've had feedback from the Harmony area. We've also had feedback from uh, the Falls about being split, uh, and it's it's just the reality of there's a school, you know, uh, less than a mile away from another school, and they're both in the same neighborhood. And, you know, so we, we, we've had those kind of comments. Uh, you know, we've had some comments about splitting Legends Run, but I think once I've talked to people and try to work through the numbers, they understand that. Okay. And uh, so it's, there has been, you know, criticism, but, but certainly I think it's been, it makes a lot of sense too. Cool. But basically what you're saying is scenario two is oh, the most popular. It is, as it stands today. As it stands today, yes, sir. All righty, and then I'm going to move into intermediate, uh, the intermediate scenarios. <clears throat> and then the intermediate scenarios, it really comes down to, uh, we started to look at, again, how do we not split neighborhoods when possible, or, or how do we keep a school to feed into the intermediate school? Um, the same and and that we ran into some challenges again because of the location of our schools um, but Creekside Legends Ranch Bender's Landing Legends Run Wright's Landing Bristol Lakes Woodson's Reserve 
would, <laughs> under the scenario one, would move uh, to Flex 18 from Cox Intermediate, and the Meadows would move from um, Cox to Vogel. And, and this is what the numbers would look like under that scenario. Uh, currently, Cox is at 1,315 students in attendance, not necessarily who live in the zone. And under this scenario, we would have 728 students uh, at Cox and 666 at Flex 18, and Vogel would go to 1,115. And I'll just point out two things about Vogel. One, we did, a, uh, if you remember, we did an expansion there a couple uh -huh. of years ago. Mm -hmm. And then the other, so it's larger than 1,000. It's about 1,200 capacity. Uh, the other thing is, is, and when we do Flex 19, there's a real good chance that'll be a K6 in which that would impact enrollment at, at Vogel. And Flex off 19 will be off the 242 mm -hmm. corridor. Yes, sir. Hey, Dave, trying to found your 200 students. You found oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but somebody's still having kids. Like. <laughs> now, and, I, and I will tell you, for intermediate, we're using current students in uh, third and fourth grade, which would be in fifth and sixth right. when we open the school to get closer numbers. And so on the map, um, again, 57K is the Meadows area. And, um, and, and the feedback there from the Meadows has been they do not want it to be rezoned to, to Vogel. Uh, we've had these other areas kind of a split. I'm going to point out a couple of the challenges. Under this one, if you notice, um, Snyder mostly mm -hmm. would go to Flex 18, except for the Harmony neighborhoods, which are right across the street from Cox. And again, yeah. it goes back to it just didn't make sense to the committee why you could walk to school we would put you on a bus. Yeah. Uh, so that, and the other one is Lockridge Farms, which is a neighborhood on the, which is right here, 57 in. Again, they're at the back side of Snyder and Cox and York, and they can walk to school. And we did not want to put them on the bus over to Flex 18. So it, it did create some some splits in this particular scenario. Um, We're splitting Burnham Woods as well, correct? And Burnham Woods as well. Okay. And uh, really about the only area that doesn't get split is uh, Snyder. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Broadway. That's one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. and now, the next one is Scenario 2, uh, which moves Ooh. Creekside, the Falls, Bender's Landing, Legends mm -hmm. Run, Wright's Landing, Bristol Lakes, Woodson's Reserve, from Cox to Flex 18 and Meadows would go from Cox to Vogel. And uh, this produces very close numbers. Uh, Flex 18 is a little bit smaller under this scenario. Cox is a little bit larger under this scenario. And actually, after our last uh, ABC meeting, our committee liked this scenario with a twist. And the twist was to move Trace, which currently goes to Bradley, over to Flex 18 with the rest of Bradley um, so they don't split off. Uh, they would stay with their elementary school. So um, that if that happens, uh, that would put our, our schools at the same number, exactly. Wow. So it would, op you know, on projection, it won't be that way when we really open it. <laughs> on paper today, they would be exactly the same size. And they both have some areas for growth. Okay. Uh, so this, it's also a better looking map. Um, and, and trace. Trace is going to be 57G. G. Okay. So if 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 we do that, 57G would be pink on this map. Can you and go go down so I can see the legend? Uh, it doesn't look like the north part is changing much. There, thank you. It can. Can. What's the capacity of Vogel? Vogel's 1,200. Look like you hit that. Do we? Are we right there? Eleven fifty. We're going to be close. Two forty-two K through six is going to take some pressure off of it. Okay. About two years from now. Yeah. Or two years after this. <laughs> two thousand nineteen is when we would open. Nineteen was sometime in the future. Okay. That. But yes, that's it. Would put put Vogel very tight for a couple of years. <laughs> Let's shrink that on there. And then here's the side by side. And then again, if we go with what I think the committee is leaning to, which is the 57G would be pink, um, and that the rest it would be very even numbers. The 
you know, there still would be growth in both areas. Um, okay. Probably, you know, from a from a space standpoint, we don't know what's going to happen up here in okay. 57H, even if they can develop in that area. So we don't know, but okay. something could change in the future that might make us have to revisit that. But it should be several years. Yeah. Okay, with with the thought of making 57G pink, what does that do to the Sorry, I know we're Scott skipping around, but what does that do to the elementary? That would leave them with the Bradley cohort, which under scenario two is mostly going to flex 18. Okay. And so that would at least leave them with an elementary school group. Okay. So which is why it makes sense. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you for it. If I, and this I, I one, got confused. No, I understand. And, and Too close together. Um, and there's so many variables and there's a lot of different things we look at so you know and it's like so many things with zoning we start playing with one thing you usually you move something it usually undoes something else that mm -hmm. you didn't mean to so um, it's a really interesting process so that's scenario two and that's kind of the side by side um, and it produces very even numbers one of the fastest growing areas currently is in the area in harmony though the new area the new mm -hmm. section I think it's Allegro, maybe, or something. What, like what about area 55, 56, and 57 E? Are those <coughs> are, are those areas that are growing? Are they grown out? What's uh, 56, the? 56. Oh, down south in Vogel. Um, not a whole lot. We're getting some growth. We are getting some growth in that area, but it's not not super fast. Okay. I, I see it on. Is, is the line on the, for lack of better ways to put it, I, I assume it would be south. The south side of, of, of 56, is that Spring Creek? Or is that the, the Spring Creek? Mm -hmm. That's oh, our, south that's of 56? Border, right? south. Yes, yeah, that's, that's Spring, Spring Creek. Creek. I'm sorry. That yes, goes right yeah. along I had right. to find 56. So is first. that why some of that is not growing? I'm, I'm not being I, yes. rude. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, you see the border. Right there. Yeah. yeah. See the see that the house probably is underwater. Mm -hmm. Well, I just they did build them there. I will I will say that one of the things we've gone back and done, um, we've kind of corrected our future maps to break off this section that's on the 99 corridor, so that if that ever does get developed, it will be its own section. So we've kind of put in a boundary, just anticipating future development, and so. Um, that way we can orient that where we want it to put it. But that would be, for example, if it's on 99, it would be very close to Broadway. Okay. Um, I know this is a this is a difficult situation. I mean, it's just it's just it's not easy because of the the density. But the Vogel area, I know we hadn't got to the high schools yet, but the Vogel area is it's it's not as dense, right? So it's about the numbers. Um, but I could see 54, 55, 56, 57, those, those areas with that same logic of, man, I could almost walk to high school versus going all the way back up to, to the Oak Ridge area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, you have to put dividing lines somewhere. Well, that's not a walk. That's not a walk. Yeah, that's... Of course. Big, 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 I'm, I'm exaggerating, of okay. course. Right. But, but I mean that... But in proximity... Okay. Right. In proximity, it's going to be closer to uh, to the new high school that's going in, especially down here at 57E. And I know we have to draw the line somewhere. So it's has there been any consideration for those for those things, and also any kind of you know, diversity, socioeconomic, any kind of diversity. I know it's about the numbers, and 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 we want to make sure that you know we're not overpopulating the schools. But at, at what point in the planning has there been or will there be any discussion about diversity of schools, diversity of kids, um, all of those things? It, you know, it, does, it is part of our conversation. It's not the sole driver, the most important, but I think we do look at it. And uh, so that section that you're, you're looking at is 57E, which is Forest Village and Spring Forest. And uh, when you look at the high school scenario, too, that actually flips from uh, Oak Ridge to Grand Oaks 
and ex and we move some some that go currently go to York to Oak Ridge under that scenario, and it's um, and all those all of those do impact and and do have a, an impact on the the balance in terms of social economics. Um, in 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 looking at it, it is become one of those challenges. Of, do you want to move everybody? all over the place to achieve balance or do does it make sense to try to keep people kind of oriented where they're oriented and where they go um, and, that, and that's a great question and I don't know that there's a clear consensus I think people felt our committee felt pretty good about um, the intermediate especially if we know we can get some relief for Vogel in the future um, you know I think the high school there was a lot more discussion on what the outcomes were and, and how the balance uh, was achieved, but uh, but it, again, it's it's also a reality of you know we build a school um, on the on this far south side, and it's going to pull some of the communities that are oriented towards it, and they're going to be the newer communities, and mm -hmm. you know, and so there is some of that, you know, the new schools are going to go where the the but newer neighborhoods are. It, but doesn't the same same uh, to by the same token doesn't the, the fix for Vogel also, um, if there is any offset of socioeconomic conditions, doesn't that partially fix that, or doesn't it drive it back the other way? I, you I know, don't know if you've looked at it. We, we have, and I don't. That. I don't know I mean, that it, it, it. I understand it's not the driver. Yeah, but. it's you know, but there is an imbalance. I mean, it, it, there's you know, currently at at Vogel, it's like 38. I'm, I'm just, it's not exact on here. It's like 38 percent, and then at Cox, it's like 18 percent. Or somewhere in that range and so, um, so you've got some discrepancy now I would say as the school district goes our average is 37 percent and so just to give you a perspective of what the district average is but we have some schools with very high percentages we have some schools with very low percentages but, and we have some that are very mixed but 200 more kids in the Oak Ridge feeder of high socioeconomic just I mean it just oh writes the ship if you will if the ship is is, is lean. No. depending on what we do in the future yes there could be changes in the, the social well economy. i mean i just look at the area that you're pulling from off of 242 and it's obvious i mean it's just it, 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 so i don't know whatever and i'm coming at this from a mom perspective here but it's a lot easier to uh, move your kids to different schools when they're still in k through four and then they meet new friends in fifth and sixth then them shifting in their teen years uh their social groups and especially as mom of teenage daughters those are so incredibly important and so uh, i like that in the intermediate model we're not looking at you know kind of keeping cox and flex all going to york correct or is any of that switching to irons? The only section that would move to irons that we would envision would be the meadows. meadows which under both of these scenarios, but that that they would switches, go elementary. They, they go elementary all the, all the way, way through. through, and that's that's my point. I mean, I, I understand that we're not going to be able to avoid with how much of a high growth area this is moving the elementary students and having a lot of our elementary split between intermediate schools uh, that's just going to be a reality over here for a while but if we can keep them from intermediate together all the way through that's something that i personally think is an important goal for kids in their development and in their growth with friend groups I 100% I agree. Okay. Absolutely agree with that exact statement. You know, we've, so. in generalizing, because that's what we have to do, generalizing, you're 100% you're right. Kids, families will move around, but when you, you start hearing parents saying, I can't move now because my kid's in seventh grade, and this is the group of kids that they're going to be with moving forward. So, yeah, if, if that has to be a goal, I would believe, to keep those kids together from seventh grade mm -hmm. on moving forward. I, I would agree with that. Um, so yeah, switching up at K through sixth grade. Obviously, we don't want to do that. We don't want to split it up all that. All we that don't want to do it often. <laughs> What's that? We don't want to do it often. <laughs> right, right. And I know that there's still that this community, our entire CISD, is still going to continue to grow, and we'll have some new schools, and maybe some of these issues will be fixed later on. 
Um, but I do believe that, and I don't, I don't have the answer, but I'd love to take back to the, uh, to the, to the committee um, to discuss some of these areas of, uh, you know, if we're, if we have the opportunity to have a balanced school from a, a standard of when you walk into school, it's a diverse, we have an opportunity to have some diversity in these schools and it may make splitting up a little bit, a little bit painful K through six. I think that is okay. If we could make it seven, seventh grade on and then also have some diversity in these schools versus not. How are we defining diversity? Well, um, you've got, you've got uh, your socioeconomic, Okay. You got uh, some pockets that that don't have anything. You know, there are some schools out there that it's that there's there's no diversity. You take a, a you take a school like a Conroe High, it's Conroe High, and it's extremely more diverse than than the Woodlands, and Oak Ridge High is more diverse. So, if we have the opportunity to to have to to, to have some diversity, I think we need to look into it. I, mean, we, I think we just need to have it as a consideration. Uh, I would also be concerned. I know it's not the driving factor again, but um, if any of these schools are on the bubble as far as being eligible for Title I funding, I would hate to see that you know a small shift in SES status jeopardize a Title I program at a school. Yeah, I understand. And uh, under the... Oh, no, I will, I will... But one of the charges of the committee, uh, Mr. Hubert, and, and the board, is to look at all of those factors and, and to take those into um, consideration when you can, when it makes geographic sense and those types of things. Because we've had numerous conversations about how this, um, this what do we call these planning units and sections, <laughs> change the economic um, status of the school. So that's been on the board from day one, having those conversations. I was just going to point out that in one of the changes that if we do scenario two with the change in 57G, that brings those two intermediates almost to the same socioeconomic balance as well as enrollment. And uh, and so I, I, I don't want you to think that we didn't look at those things. That, that those have been part of I the I didn't mean to imply that you yeah. don't. Yeah. I just wanted. To, I was just curious where it was in the in the pecking order, and I, I wasn't hearing it, so that's why I just want to make sure that that's noted. That I think it, I just think it needs to be considered. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions, or statements, comments? No, no. Okay. I'm gonna last set of scenarios, the high school scenarios, um, and this has been um, probably the the most difficult conversations, but they've been very healthy. Um, We've there have been lots of questions and lots of issues that we've talked about, uh, and they they do revolve around some some of the bigger questions have been, well, how big do we want Oak Ridge to be, how big do we want Grand Oaks to be, how much room do we want to leave at Grand Oaks, uh, and then the other one is is this issue of the split junior high, and that's been a big part of the conversation about uh, you know what that does if we have students that go up through a system and then. For high school, we bring them over, and so uh, we we have very little room to absorb um, big shifts in enrollment over at the junior high. We can handle moving some students from um, the meadows, but when we get beyond that, we really don't have the capacity. Um, so we've been limited by that. Um, so as a result, there was two basic scenarios or kind of prevailing schools of thought that that made it have come out of the committee. Uh, the first one, high school scenario one, looks very much like the current junior high boundary with the exception being the Meadows coming over into Oak Ridge High School. Um, and and this would, re this would re result in, um, under this enrollment, uh, 2,420 students would be at Grand Oaks at, when it's all four grades in 2020 based on current 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade enrollment. It's just for clarification, and the Meadows would be in that feeder zone from elementary? They would, they, under this be proposal, it would be elementary up to high school. And then in 2270 is what Oak Ridge High School would be at, um, which has been, you know, it's, it's, it's 
Can part I of the discussion. Clarify yes. something. That is in 2020. Until we right. phase in all four grades, Oak Ridge is still going to be at higher enrollment because it still has all the same juniors and seniors that it would have had regardless. Yes, correct? it would be a stair step kind of right. a, 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 a change. And let me clarify that that, that is the low of Oak Ridge because of the 242 <coughs> sector being rezoned. Attention. Hey, it's a good looking map here. <laughs> <laughs> I understand this is I got. got <laughs> There's only two colors. It, it's pretty simple. <laughs> If the road it's, was straight, we'd really have it. Now. <laughs> well, the current high school map's real easy to understand. It's all blue, yeah. and so um, this 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 would, this would create another uh, another boundary, and so that is uh, the Grand Oaks is the lighter color on this uh, map, and so you can see the areas. And again, as I mentioned, this is pretty much um, the way it looks with today's junior high, with the exception of 57K, mm -hmm. which. Wow is currently at Burnham Woods, which would be moving over to Kaufman. To Kaufman. And then the other scenario is the scenario that presents, uh, keeps Oak Ridge at a larger capacity. This is scenario two. Uh, and this one is, starts with the two, uh, the two junior highs um, but it also um, it, it makes some changes from the junior high and that is the Forest Village Spring Forest area which currently goes to Irons after Irons <coughs> would go to Grand Oaks that's that area up along Rayford on the south side of Rayford um, and then the areas that are Trace Legends of Stage and Legends Ranch would stay at Oak Ridge High School and they're currently at and would still be at York Junior High School, mm -hmm. and so this this would result in a bigger Oak Ridge and a smaller Grand Oaks, and you can see the enrollment numbers, um, the map, and I'll just point out the areas. So 57. You want to make it larger? <laughs> so what's different? And I'll bring up the side by side here in a second. This is uh, currently the Meadows. Still, every picture of 57K is going to be the Meadows. And then we have Legends Estates, Legends Ranch, and then Legends Trace uh, come over into the blue. Uh, and then 56 goes over to Grand Oaks. Um, and so one of the things... Why is it in blue? 57. I'm sorry, 57 E. Okay. I'm sorry, 57 E. 57 E. Uh, 57 A, just to orient you, 57 A is Fox Run. Okay. So just to kind of get you oriented where we are on the... And that's Rayford running along right along there. Can we see the side by side? So, so again, how many of the? Uh, give me the numbers again that split, uh, uh, that go a different way from their junior high high school theater. Yeah. It would be about three hundred and. Well, I, I mean, which no? I'm sorry, not not how many kids? Which of these fifty sevens, fifty sixes, okay, twenty threes? Right. So, in in in, yeah. in scenario one. There would be none. I like right. scenario one. And then in scenario two, it would be all the students that are in 57S, 57C, 57X, 57G, and 57E would okay. all be in a got different field. Thank you. Yes. Now, I, I see the two boxes. So can you explain to me, because I, I know we have reasons for both scenarios. Um, scenario number two, the reason for the flip and the desire to move certain kids that were at Irons now going to Grand Oaks and <coughs> vice versa, the kids that were at Irons or that were at York. Irons. That would be Grand Oaks normally going to Oak Ridge mm -hmm. in scenario two. I, and, and for an and larger, larger enrollment at Oak Ridge, is that our driving force is to keep Oak Ridge larger. What what is the reason behind scenario? I think there's two two reasons. One, it's a more balanced socioeconomic okay map. Which one? Uh, what number two. two? What's the difference? And uh, so in 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 this scenario, in scenario two, uh, it Oak Ridge is at thirty three percent, and 
Grand Oaks is at 22. Okay. And under scenario one, Oak Ridge is at 38, and Grand Oaks is at 19 and a half. Okay. Okay. Take me back to the numbers on 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 scenario two. <coughs> Okay, what happens to Oak Ridge High School when, when you rezone, yeah. assuming you rezone the 242 area, which I think is in the, in the making because yeah. you're going to open a school there. I mean, the kids aren't just going to automatically appear. You're going to have to rezone. So K through 6, just assuming that on 242, have you looked at what that does to the Oak Ridge number? No. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, what is <laughs> that's 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 why I, I have a I'm, I think I think we have a sh short term issue that's fixing itself. Does that make any sense, Mr. Husbands? If I think you're, you're um, if I'm interpreting correctly, there's going to be a need 242 area, 1488 area with all the growth there. In the coming years, and where are we going to put the to kids? where we're going to put those kids? And, and are we going to run them all the way around to Grand Oaks, or take them somewhere, whatever? I mean, I think yes. the problem is go we're going to recreate a problem at Oak Ridge, and then you're going to have to rezone the blue. Yeah. Well, but and here's my question: mm. Is that looking at the enrollment? What is the capacity at Oak Ridge? I know we're over. So Oak Ridge is capacity about thirty six fifty, and and it's at forty one something today. So we have a sea of portable buildings there. We obviously, in a perfect world, we'd like to be out of the portable buildings and in a much smaller uh, enrollment at that school. Right. Well, but if we're looking down the road, like six to eight years, is the projections, kind of what John's saying, if I'm understanding right, that a lot of some of the community that goes to Oak Ridge, uh, will that? student populations stay the same or you know how some communities um i can jump in and, yeah for instance like the um harper's preserve i think there's a, another thousand homes projected mm -hmm. to be built okay uh, that's an example of one area that's already there uh, plus we're seeing lots of other startups through that whole area so it's not the where the People stay, their kids grow up, but they stay, and so there's not the student age kids. There's still what you're saying, there's a lot of growth uh -huh. that will still be there. Are, um, their projections are to add a thousand more homes to that area. Okay. So there's, there's and no. That, and that's organic growth within what's already zoned there. Yes. But as you enlarge that area, of, you know, there, there's kids that you don't want to have to move twice. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. Can I see your numbers on scenario one again? Why, why are you picking it up, Mr. Husband, to your point? That, yeah, we don't want those kids to move around too much, but if by chance, and I know we're we're behind this guy here, the development goes to where there is a need for a high school off 242, we also have to understand that that high school and zoning could also affect College Park and Woodlands High because a lot of those kids in that area go to those two schools, so we'll be given the opportunity to address First of all, I'm not yeah. talking about, I mean, I, I think we're a long ways yeah, from a high school. But what I'm talking about is 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 the 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 rezoning to Oak Ridge of population on the 242 corridor. Right. And if that happens, uh, you're going to need the room at Oak Ridge, and you're not going to have it in scenario two. Okay? And whereas you have it right here, and Grand Oak speaks for itself, you have growth possibility yeah. there because it's coming there for sure right, right. yeah I, but, uh, I agree to, to mr. husband's point can I have a question about that what are our capacities not including portables or how many portables do we have right now on Woodlands campus and College Parks campus I think at Woodlands we're at 14 is that correct somewhere in that number. and then in a College Parks at what two I think two. just two right now but as as this 1488 i mean we're seeing it i'm moving off of 1488 now you live off of 1488 skeeter i mean there's tons of development along 1488 and 242. at some point i mean you already have 14 portables at the woodlands you have two at college park it's coming it, it's coming that we're going to have to do something in the future and i think mr husband's point 
is that while scenario one puts lower enrollment at Oak Ridge temporarily, that it's probably not going to stay that way because of those growths. And so I think kind of what you're pointing out, John, is that the low socioeconomic will also shift when that happens, correct? Well, what I'm trying to point out without getting too specific about where, who goes where and what right. goes who in eight years from now right. is <laughs> it's a whole lot better to have capacity at both schools. That's Agreed. all I'm trying to say. Which schools go, I mean, which right. kids go to which school is a little premature. Agreed. But I think when you start talking about leaving 2,600 kids at Oak Ridge, it's worth bringing up, okay? Sure. But I'm not trying to rezone the whole school district right now. Uh, I'm just trying to say let's leave some room. It, sure. And I, I wanted to share I one. I went too far I, I, because I, I think we can get out there and start saying what ifs all night long, but you never I think know. we need to balance those schools and leave room. And, and, I'll, and I'll just point out one of the conversations within our committee has been um, because of the location of Grand Oaks really being kind of at the, at the edge there, um, we do know that having Oak Ridge being more central gives us more flexibility in the future should we need that capacity uh, to take advantage of. Uh, the other side of that is what we're always, and nobody has a crystal ball to know how fast and when and, and if the growth will come. Uh, one, of the, one of the worries about scenario two is will we leave Grand Oaks too small? Will it, will it never fill up? And, and you know, the, the, the one reality, and I'll just remind everybody, is whatever we do, we can always make adjustments in the future. And, and it's tough and it's difficult, but 10 years from now, we may say, whoops, we need to do this or do that. <laughs> Every 10 um, years from now. Yeah. So, Dr. Hines, can you remind me to the minimum size for a 6A as far as enrollment is? I'm going to look at about 2,200, 2,100. Two, 20, I, I know it is, and I know the UIL right changed now, it. Right the That's what I was thinking. It was okay. less, a little less than 20. So it doesn't jeopardize anybody's 6A status. Okay. Very well. When, uh, well, I mean, you might get to it. I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment. <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, those are the two scenarios. I put, again, there they are, the side by side. And, <clears throat> and so where we're at, um, the committee's taking into consideration the feedback that we've, we've presented these scenarios. We've received lots of feedback, and our goal is to select a recommendation and rec or recommendations to be made to you in January. I will tell you, with the high school, uh, our committee has, you know, you saw the two varying plans. I will tell you the, they're both represented fairly closely on the committee, and uh, so just so you'll know that. Um, we have a great committee. They've worked really hard. They've shown up at the public meetings. They've been there. They've heard the comments. Uh, they've, they've done that extra work to, to, to know how people feel. And, um, and there really truly have been lots of opinions on all the sides and, and all the angles. And so um, it's, been, it's been a good process. And it's like any process, um, there, there's not total agreement. There are different viewpoints, and we're trying to weigh them all and make the best recommendation we can. Our hope is to uh, we're going to get our committee gets back together again in early January. We'll hopefully have something to go back out to share with the com community, and then our, our plan is to bring forward recommendation or recommendations back to you in January. Can I ask one more question that I've been asked? Is that, and I just haven't heard of it, but I assume there's no plans at the present time to have any sort of Academy at Grand Oaks that would bring in students from Mean other. Oak Ridge. Mean Oak Ridge. What did I call? You Grand say Grand Oaks. Either one. Either one. The new well, one or? Yeah, the new. I mean, okay. like, yes. College Park has the academy, and so of those hundred and so plus kids, a lot of them are from other areas of the Woodlands that would go to other high schools that are enrolled at college. So I was just wondering, are there any plans? We've actually talked about the academy at Oak Ridge High School. Where there's, where there's uh, it's more centrally located, right. um, but we have had those conversations. In, in addition, currently we plan to leave the the Air Force Junior ROTC at Oak Ridge, so that if students wanted to attend that, they would transfer to Oak Ridge to attend that. And we've we've talked about other administrative things that we would do in response to whatever scenario we come up with, how to make it work the best. And that's always our commitment: is we feel like we're going to deliver quality schools to our students. However it goes, we're gonna we're gonna make it work, and we're gonna do a good job. Uh, Kinds, I'd just like to say uh, there couldn't be anybody with a more 
analytical approach that you have and, and your work on this. I, I know it's 57 E and G and K and Z to us, <laughs> but it's children. And I know you're taking each child. I mean, you know, I, I, I can just see uh, you, 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 you're worrying about this all the time and, 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 and really punching the numbers. So I just want to thank you publicly for your hard, your, your hard work. Well, thank you. And, and, it, and it takes a leader to go through a process like this, and we thank you. Well, I appreciate it. So. And we thank we, you. know, And I thank you for pointing that out because our committee does talk about these aren't numbers on a piece of paper. These are families and children, and they're very serious about it. Very good. Thank you. Also, Mr. Fisher, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Husbands, thank you for that. I was going to make that same comment. Um, you know, all th these these uh, we have conversations daily about um, this process, and and our you know, I think the big goal was to get lots of input, yeah. and we're getting lots of input. <laughs> and and there, and Chris, you're doing a great job leading that. So thank, thank you. you. All right. Uh, item 4E, capital improvement update, allow the order. Dr. Sack. Ms. Foster. Good evening again. Good this time I'd like to give you an update on our capital improvements that are underway within the district. Starting with Grand Oaks High School, this project is on schedule. It is scheduled to open for school in August of 2018. You can see from the pictures here the uh, <clears throat> main building structure is nearing completion the cranes and things of that nature are leaving the site in the very near future parking lots are mostly done work is beginning on the interior of the structure what we're looking here is the ground floor of the academic area so those areas are coming well you can see the mechanical systems walls uh, things of that nature are going in as we speak the upper levels the second floor and third floor are in progress as well as we're creating and building out that structure our safety and security project, which this is, we're in phase one. We are nearing the completion of phase one. It wraps up in uh, between now and the middle of January. Uh, this is our project where we're upgrading the uh, security cameras, uh, access control, security vestibules, things of that nature around the district. We'll bring forward for you in the spring uh, phase two as we develop and, and move on with that project. At Grangeland Intermediate, this project is on schedule. Uh, we're turning it over for students to use when they return from the winter break. You can see from this picture, it is cleaning up nicely. The interior, the classrooms are, are complete and ready. They're, they've been, at this point, furnished. Uh, technology is moving their equipment in to get set up and ready for the students when they come back. Since our photograph has taken the, the common corridors, the, the areas in between the classrooms are also uh, more complete than we're showing here. At, the, at this point, those, those are ready uh, and becoming clean and, and final clean as we move our furniture in. At Lucille Bradley Elementary School, this one is on schedule. It's scheduled to open in August of 2017. That's a cool. Mm -hmm. uh, this project is uh, moving along nicely. The structural steel is complete. The roofing is underway. Uh, exterior masonry uh, is began last month, which we saw pictures of. This month, progress on the inside of the building is really taking shape. Again, with the uh, this is a view from the second floor uh, down through the library into the commons area. Uh, the mechanical systems, the large equipment, has also been delivered at this point, so this project is moving along nicely. The Woodlands College Park, this is our robotics project. Uh, this project is underway. It is currently on schedule. As you can see from the building structure, they're, uh, they're getting ready to start the roof and the masonry. Uh, this one is in the critical path. Weather does have a role in how this, one, how this one plays out. It is scheduled to turn over in the spring. Our goal to be to furnish it during spring break. So when the when the children uh, students come back from spring break, they have a can take over and use that facility. But it is a spring turnover for that project. Our network operations center, which is in this building, is the uh, network center. That's the central infrastructure for everything that we use to function in our daily lives as operations and for our students and their education. Uh, what we're looking at is a picture of uh, offices that are being uh, expanded in, in the building B in this building. This project is on schedule. Uh, it is currently on, underway and has a, has a, a lot of com complex pieces as we take the new systems online and bring our current systems offline to complete that project. But it will be finished uh, in the summer of 2017. And that's our update. Thank, Thank you very much, you. Mr. Foster. Thank you. Any questions for him? <laughs> Foster. Item 5A, financial reports, Dr. Stock. Mr. Rice, will you please come and present the financial reports, please? 
palpitantes. Good evening, President and Husbands, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements for the district for the month of November. Uh, these statements will include the general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. The first statement we'll look at this evening is the balance sheet. Our balance sheet includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances for the district. We always like to take a look at our cash and investments. And as we can see, if we concentrate here on the general fund, we had cash on hand of $13,300, bank deposits of $179,000, investments in our pools of $76 million, other investments, $28.8 million, investments uh, with TCG Investment Advisors, $50,900,000, for total cash and investments of about $156 million. And just to uh, follow our property taxes, just about a half a percent above where we were last year, so collections are just starting to roll in, so that's, that's a good trend. <coughs> Next statement we'll look at is our income statement. The income statement includes our revenues and expenditures and fund balances. Revenues are broken down into three categories. That is local and intermediate sources, which is primarily our property taxes for the general fund and debt service fund. We have state program revenues and then federal program revenues. We can also look at our expenditures by major category for each one of the funds. And those are trending very well. Uh, the next statement is our 2015 bond referendum status. We've currently expended and encumbered $216.3 million. We have an estimate to complete of $299.7 million. That leaves us with a projected forecast of the program of $515.9 million. Leave us about $4.3 million worth of contingency for, for the bond referendum. Love this report, love showing this report. Over the years, we've always been trending negatively. Uh, we're seeing the results of the changes that we made in our plan. Uh, for the year, we've had total revenues of $11,200,000. We've had expenses of $9.6 million for revenue, uh, revenues over expenses of $1.6 million. Uh, participation at our wellness center, we're averaging about 433 visits a month right now. So good trend there. We know December's coming up with those two weeks. We'll see a little uptick, but it'll be a good test for our changes. Our investments for the month, uh, our par value at the end of November was $420.7 million. The wham of the pools is one day. They're yielding about 78 basis points. The wham of our other investments, that's one year or less, is about 157 days, and we're yielding a little over 1%. Our longer term investments with TCG Investment Advisors, about 578 days and we're yielding just also a little bit over 1%. That just kind of shows us what the yield curve's doing right now. So the wham of our combined portfolio is seven, 76 days, and we're yielding about 79 basis points. And our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is about 46 basis points. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in the notice of this meeting is authorized by section 551.071 and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. So the board determined that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be at either A, this public meeting upon reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at the subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. It is 710. 723. Right. The board is now in open session. It is 8.50 p.m. Next item on the agenda. Uh, I would just uh, have a statement to read on uh, item 8A. All members of the district's Board of Trustees have completed training required by state law with the exception of the board's newest member, Mr. Moore, who was sworn in just last month. Mr. Moore is scheduled to complete his training within the required timeline. Item uh, 8B, uh, Board Member Code of Conduct. Dr. Stockton? Um, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Galavis. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. As you know, every year um, all the employees in the school district and all the students in Conroe ISD sign um, uh, 
a form indicating that they will follow the code of conduct and you all are asked to do the same thing. This is the same one you've seen before and it addresses things like you of course will follow board policy that you won't try to resolve complaints. You will turn them to, media, to the administration to address. You won't engage in conflicts of interest or the appearance thereof by speaking to vendors or of the district and those things are all in the document. So I know you all have reviewed it if you will sign it before the end of the night and give me that uh, signature page. That would be what the code of conduct is. All right. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Gladys. Item 8C, Dr. Stockton uh, considered uh, delegating authority to you to negotiate. Uh, we have a motion to be read. Excuse me. I have a motion. I move that the board delegate authority to Dr. Stockton to negotiate, finalize, and execute a settlement as discussed in executive session. Should an agreement be reached in the mediation of cause number 15-06, Dash O six one seven seven. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed like sign. Item passes. And item eight D, reorganization of the board. Do we have a motion? Yes, sir. I would make a motion to reorganize the board as follows. President Melanie Bush, first vice president Datron Williams, second vice president Skeeter Hubert. Secretary Ray Sanders, Assistant Secretary Scott Kidd. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. All opposed, like sign. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mr. Bush, and uh, the rest of you. And uh, on that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. And we, we have the board code of conducts. Oh, make sure you sign your conduct. Before if you if board you'll conduct. sign those before you go, please. And it is 851. Understand <laughs>